So, okay, so it sounds, it sounds to me like modern monetary theory is there out of a humanitarian need to stabilise the understanding of the monetary system for the well, because you need to have that understanding of such a complex system in order that it functions and you don't end up with a death spiral like you have in Spain, that kind of thing. Uh, and I wonder, have you ever heard of the Zeitgeist movement? Uh, um, no. Zeitgeist uh, movement. Well, Zeitgeist means uh, this... I understand Zeitgeist. Yeah. Google brings out Zeitgeist every year and that kind of thing. The Zeitgeist movement is trying to advocate a a change from using money as a means of resource distribution and resource allocation, capital allocation, that kind of thing. A lot of people say that that's utopian and unnecessary, given the fact that, or given the idea that you can bring about stability through a monetary system, which I think is what modern monetary mm -hmm. theory says, that you can have, when correctly understood, you can have a stable not precisely. It's, it doesn't think that you can repeal the business cycle, mm. uh, but it says that you can make it a lot less severe. Yeah. And indeed, the automatic stabilizers empirically have made it a lot less severe. So we don't have the Great Depressions, mm. uh, and uh, we recover more quickly uh, uh, from those kinds of crises. Uh, yeah. And they were never as deep to begin with. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that they aren't still really serious for tens of millions of people, uh, so the jobs guarantee component uh, of uh, modern monetary, uh, it, it isn't intrinsic to modern monetary theory, but it flows from it for yeah. most people, that is a policy device, why would we waste people yeah. in unemployment? So in that sense, they say, yeah, there's still going to be business cycles, but we can make them even stronger automatic stabilizers, plus we can reduce dramatically the human cost mm. of the uh, instability. So I guess that's how we would state it a, a yeah. bit more precisely. Well, the, the main, I think, I think perhaps the main reason that the, the Zeitgeist movement is, is now calling for a change from the monetary system is that we perceive a, a new phenomenon uh, in humankind, which is technological unemployment. So the way that uh, in the workplace, people are replaced by machines, uh, jobs are automated. The agricultural sector is a, a good example of something which, when <coughs> going back a long way in history, I suppose now, but the agricultural sector was where there was, you either worked out on the farm, you know, and that sort of thing. Now it's been, I think, 80% mechanised, automated, the agricultural sector um, worldwide, so that you don't need to have hands on the ground and in a way that's humane because now people aren't forced to do repetitive jobs which make them ignorant but of course it's inhumane because now as you say they're out of employment and in the monetary system if you're out of employment that means you're suffering basically obviously there's exceptions but in the under the duress of technological unemployment and the zeitgeist movement has uh, or, or predicts that that's going to increase, it's not going to slow down, it's going to become more and more of a, a phenomenon that's displacing people from, from the workplace. And so looking at, what, at the, the, um, <clears throat> the outcome, the consequences of that, we look to go to a more scientific way of resource allocation and resource distribution. And now, and as soon as you start talking about um, uh, everyone gain, having access without having to pay for things, or you start talking about inequality of resource access, people start thinking that you're communist. This is my experience of it anyway. I start talking about this, they're like, oh, it's just communism. And um, I think th the, the idea of communism is that um, it, well, it was made during a time when we didn't have the types of technology and globalization that we have now. And communism isn't really applicable or relevant at this point in time. Um, so, in light of that phenomenon, how, how is it that we can continue with a, a monetary system of allocation even though people 
might be able to sell their labour in exchange for fiat currency or any gold backed currency, anything like that. After a certain point of globalisation, you've got three billion people competing to clean the toilet, and someone you know they'll accept lower and lower wages, and it's a real it's a real problem. And uh, the abolition of the monetary system is a long term goal of the Zeitgeist movement, where we're no longer using a credit based, a debt based um, scenario there for people's livelihood, uh, livelihoods. What do you think? So, uh, this has been a long debate in economics uh, and such with people making similar predictions mm -hmm. for 100 plus years uh, and such. Um, certainly, until very recently, it hasn't proven to be accurate. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, technological advances have not uh, produced a situation uh, where there's some kind of a complete race uh, to the bottom mm. or mass unemployment and indeed um, arguably it's going the opposite direction uh, because of technological change. Technological change uh, has created uh, literally hundreds of millions of new jobs mm -hmm. uh, and such and of course it's transformed many people's lives mm -hmm. uh, in ways that at least materially we can always, you know, talk about the, the Geist part of Zeitgeist, uh, the spirit, um, but certainly in terms of material nature I have changed it in a way that's very positive. You know, so uh, life expectancy is up enormously uh, and life expectancy in even poorer nations, as long as they're not failed states, mm. is up enormously. Um, the chances of uh, not dying in infancy and not dying in childbirth are vastly uh, improved uh, and such. Um, and there the, the big technological change typically is safe water systems uh, and such. Yeah. So um, when, we, when we teach developmental economics, and I do a bit of this uh, in a class on Latin American development and such. Um, we certainly don't take the view that technology uh, inevitably uh, produces it. Uh, this uh, sort of, as I say, race to the uh, bottom. Um, what you've seen even in recent times is massive numbers of people being brought out of extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. So of course this is primarily uh, China and India, which were by far the largest uh, suppliers of it really extreme. Uh, poverty and, and continue, uh, particularly in the case of India, to be the places that if you really want to deal with extreme poverty and talking about literally uh, over a hundred million people, uh, that you would really be concentrating mm -hmm. your efforts. Um, if you did distribution simply at the national level, in a place like India, there is not remotely enough wealth uh, in India yeah. to deal with the problem of mass really severe. So, um, you know, I'm not as big of a proponent as some of the folks on this, but they would argue that this was um, would be very harmful mm -hmm. uh, to the poorest of the poor people um, because they would argue it would uh, dramatically reduce the incentive structure of the folks that have been bringing, um, and bringing sort of on the rate of up to five million people a year out of extreme poverty, which is nothing, you know, mm -hmm. to, to take uh, lightly uh, in all of that. So empirically, technological advances have long been said to be about to produce this. I mean, going back Mm -hmm. uh, to the 1800s, uh, people were uh, saying this. Hasn't turned out to be true historically, but it is important, and I think the zeitgeist is right about this element, that that's not inherent. And there's nothing magic that says you couldn't have technological changes that would really lead to uh, a dramatic reduction in the number of people uh, that we needed. Not just in agriculture, because in agriculture, historically, well, did those people become unemployed in America? 
when we moved from an agrarian economy to a non-agrarian? No. I mean, uh, full employment became much more significant uh, after we moved away from a primarily agrarian existence. Because in the agrarian times, many people were either, in essence, deeply underemployed, or they were outright slaves, mm -hmm. or they were near slaves, right? So you had these contracts uh, that you signed uh, where you would be an indentured servitude mm -hmm. uh, and such, and that was very common. Uh, so slavery was a racial phenomenon in the United States, but the indentured servants were um, just poor uh, you know, working class folks from yeah. somewhere in the English Isles who emigrated uh, to the Americas. And obviously, you know, England had a long history of transporting the Irish uh, and such. Um, it's so quasi-slavery uh, through the penal system uh, was really common. That said, you could have such a breakthrough in robotics um, that you could wipe out, you know, an enormous number of manufacturing jobs yeah. and fabrication jobs. If you could wipe out an enormous number of fabrication jobs, so all those tens of thousands of people in Foxconn yeah. making the Apple um, uh, iPods uh, yeah. and such, um, then there's a real question, where would you go? If you could yeah. really a uh, robot to size, uh, not just heavy manufacturing, but all the fabrication-ish type things mm -hmm. for, um, you know, personal electronic devices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you have the 3D printing kind of phenomenon that's going on at the moment. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so maybe someday we'll actually just, you know, you bring out the equivalent of a laptop and some bigger supply of inkjet that'll be carbon yeah. uh, instead of ink, and uh, on the spot you'll fab all kinds of things mm -hmm. that we can't uh, imagine today. So it is possible that there will be a future like that, and economics doesn't prove it can't happen. Yeah. Um, and so most economists would just go roll their eyes. Yeah, because they'd heard, as I said, they've heard this for mm -hmm. over a hundred years. Um, and it's never proven to be yeah. true. Of course, it's true for some individuals. Some individuals lose their jobs. But overall, economists have been able to say that's a good thing. We're more efficient, and so you go to some other use uh, where you provide more. And you're already seeing an element of what you said, and that is the global race to the bottom uh, in terms of wages. Now, economists, again, would doubt that, and they would say, look at wages. Have they actually fallen? Well, in the developing world, of course, they haven't fallen in most cases. So we're really talking more about the rich countries uh, where you do see that the working class uh, and has in fact tended to stall for now 25 years in a lot of countries. Or you could go to places like Germany where they deliberately have engineered a reduction in real wages. That means adjusted for inflation. Right. of the working class over the last 20 years, and they're very proud of it, right? Yeah. Germany can export. And so if you, especially if you get into, we haven't mentioned this element, if you don't have modern monetary theory in your own currency, what's left is to try to be a leading exporter. Mm -hmm. So that is, we call that the road to Bangladesh strategy, yeah. right? I reduce Makes my sense. wages, and then you react, and the potential equilibrium point is an extremely low wage. The richest woman in the world, the tycoon in Australia uh, that yeah. inherited all the mining, uh, only about uh, six weeks ago went and complained uh, that Australians wouldn't work for 32 cents yeah, a day I saw that. I saw that. Uh, type of thing. So yeah. there is this mindset among some of the elites um, that this is, yes, the wondrous future. If we can get everybody in the working class, of course, you can't survive in Australia on anything like yeah. 32 cents a day uh, type of thing. So they either have not thought through or don't much care mm. what happens to people. So it's a good thing, I think, that people are considering the fact that this could go in a way that it hasn't gone in 120 plus years. 
there are some indications for the working class in the most developed nations that this is already becoming real and thinking about alternatives, very different alternatives as opposed to minor uh, fixes is something we strongly encourage. Mm -hmm. uh, you are going to have to think about incentive structures. All anybody in economics or in, you know, in um, my subfield, uh, criminology yeah. uh, and such, would strongly urge you to consider incentives. And then you come into uh, what the Austrian school of economics has always uh, argued. So Hayek and von Mises, uh, any economists from this part of the uh, profession um, have th one of their strongest points always was um, the market works in mysterious ways precisely because it is not organized. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so, you know, literally mil now billions mind. of people yeah. making individual decisions with feedback mechanisms that are constructive, they would argue, not always, we would argue, uh, in fact, sometimes disastrously wrong. But their whole point was nobody can do it better than the market, that when you try to have a central decision maker mm. that allocates uh, instead, uh, that it produces a disaster. And there have been approaches in economics to try to respond to that. So there's a whole theory of something called shadow pricing. Uh, in which you get governmental allocation, but the government creates shadow markets that tell it what markets would view as appropriate prices, and then they can at least take that into account uh, in what prices that they should be charging. Now, if you go to a system that doesn't use price to allocate mm. at all, um, then you have to really think seriously through how you're going to make the allocations and how it can be gamed and how yeah. an elite, because there still be, will be elites, yeah. uh, and the it'll be the bad elites that you fear implementing this. Yeah. The idea with the zeitgeist movement is that through technological prowess, human technological prowess, we will create, uh, it will come about, access abundance, so resource access abundance, so not so much central resource allocation being so refined that it becomes no, no need to have a price system anymore, but instead that through technological innovation we will, we will have a, well, we already have a situation where our technical reality is that we could feed and house and educate and have everyone have, technically have access to medicine or that kind of thing, but it's allowing that technology to bloom, which it really struggles to do under a monetary system where problems lead to profit. So if you don't have problems, you can't turn a buck. <coughs> and after that point where you have access abundance, then resource allocation, it can't be gamed. Because say someone wanted to come to a golf course where all the golf clubs are free and steal a bunch of them and take them back to their home, there wouldn't be any framework of reward for that because now you're just hoarding, like taking up room in your house, something you can't sell, that kind of thing. Right, but uh, any Austrian economist will say the government gets to design this system and the information flow mm -hmm. and they would say, so imagine the People's Republic of China mm -hmm. under this system. Mm -hmm. Would the state allow it to function in that fashion? Or would the rich elites say, no, we're yeah. not going to allow this technology or the, we're going to control the technology of yeah. how this operates uh, and such uh, and you know even say your carbon printer mm. um, you're not allowed to have carbon mm -hmm. printers right uh, and if we catch you we arrest you and hang you uh, mm. type of thing yeah uh, because we want to keep that a state monopoly yeah. uh, and such so that's going to be a, the critique always mm. from uh, the harder right um, there, if need is what drives, right, if the problem is what drives, well then, it, and it actually drove it successfully, then we wouldn't have poverty. Mm. So it isn't just need. Uh, so our critique would be not, in, not contradictory necessarily, 
um, but we would have the additional critique that the system doesn't respond well to problems of poor people. Mm. So trouble is not necessarily um, what kicks it in. It's only trouble if you also have the income to well, do it. A good example is the innovation warfare that goes on Tesla. The uh, mm -hmm. AM corporate entity there asked him to build a filter to filter out the static from the uh, AM. He came up with FM, which now is taking all the profits of the AM corporations. So where a new innovation comes through, which is better, it's not accepted and just absorbed and, and widely spread out. It's battled with and it, it's what it's uh, uh, the, uh <coughs> the corp the other corp the previous corporate entities the AM will attempt to suppress and uh, or, 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 or I suppose steal and, and absorb that in a way. But there's there's not much room there for cooperation once you have something which is a new innovation which is crowding out the old ways and you have these established establishments, these institutions, these organisations clinging on to what they have and at that point you have the electric car being shelved um, for many years, you have an oil, a uh, huge fossil fuels industry which cannot let go and allow for new innovations to come through that kind of thing. So the conservative economic view is again almost exactly the opposite. Yeah. Um, this is Schumpeter, uh, right, and creative destruction. Yeah. Uh, and so he, he agrees with that point. Indeed he made that um, capitalism as a hero, capitalism as a radical movement as opposed to a conservative movement, said exactly what you said, um, uh, that uh, the existing manufacturers hate it, resist it, will try to use the government to suppress it. Mm. But that uh, technological advances, which is what he was uh, not entirely but largely talking about, um, he would also be talking about innovation and management, whatever made you uh, work more effectively, yeah. produce better product, um, is a creative but destructive force. Mm. You know, so you, um, I had relatives who made mechanical adding machines uh, and such. Uh, that entire industry was destroyed uh, by electronics. And uh, you know, so uh, Schumpeter's point was uh, it's the potential to make big bucks yeah. uh, that causes folks to take on these uh, entrenched industries and all the people who say it can't be done mm -hmm. and such. And lo and behold, um, they often do triumph and uh, his response on the electrical car would be the electrical car is still not competitive yeah. without subsidies. So what, you know, what are you talking about? <laughs> that's not a better technology, mm -hmm. that's a more expensive technology. A better technology would win, yeah. uh, they would say. But now, that can ignore long-run energy costs, it can ignore all what we call externalities, the costs yeah. imposed in, on everyone else. It's only if it um, saves you, the individual uh, buyer, yeah, yeah. Uh, the money that you'll do the thing. Um, so there are exceptions uh, to e even Schumpeter's argument. The, the market won't actually produce a societally efficient uh, mm. level. Uh, but it, I think he would argue strongly that the electrical car is not yet, mm. in fact, superior technology. Mm. I got one more question for yeah. you, Bill. Is there any gold in Fort Knox? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, the fixation on gold is one of those uh, things from mm. the olden days. Um, and nobody who is remotely progressive should want anything to do with gold standards. It's a yeah. great way for causing incredible misery to uh, literally billions uh, yeah. of people so I um, think that the, all the speculation about gold is a demonstration in part of lack of trust of governments I'll grant them uh, that but uh, as a monetary system it is pretty close to the worst possible mm. monetary system.